Welcome to Wayne County Connection. I'm your host, Michael Swigert. Thanks for joining me again as we promote Wayne County as a great place to work, live, and play. As always, we do that by connecting you, our viewers, with our guests to learn more about what's going on in our communities here in Wayne County that make it such a great place to go about our daily operations and to invite in others to share in all of the wonderful excitement that is Wayne County. As always, we encourage you to visit our website at waynenet.org cc where you can learn more about today's program and past programs programs and also where you can find out information about the streaming and on-demand programming for this show and other shows actually uh, the same way but about our program uh, waynet.org cc where you can learn more information and if you're looking to get involved you might check out the calendar at waynet or put your activities on there to get connected with others in our communities that are doing great things uh, business and recreation and working with other members of our community and this month we are continuing our series on champions of youth as you know we started a series a couple of months ago with working with agencies and the individuals that are involved with those agencies that are directly impacting the youth in our communities and this month we are focusing on CASA the court appointed special advocate program for Wayne and Union County and we have joining us today Judge Darren Dolahanty from Wayne Superior Court number three and Karen Bowen, and she's the director of Casa Volunteer Services. Welcome to the show, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, for those that may recognize names, but uh, or even faces, but not know that much about you, we're going to start as we always do. And and uh, Judge, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your connections in Wayne County, which run deep. Oh, thanks. Well, I grew up in Wayne County. Was born and raised here. And other than my time at university and law school. I've lived in, in the uh, Wayne County community between either Richmond or Centerville my entire uh, life, which is moving up in the numbers uh, <laughs> faster than, than I'm comfortable with, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so I was elected to the bench in 2002 and took over on January 1st of 2003. I love to tell people my, one of my favorite uh, uh, stories is, you know, you have a good job when your very first day in office is a day off because <laughs> January 1st we're closed. Uh, but uh, that's, that's uh, it was good. It was a good day to have uh, the rest in the transition. And I've been on the bench since then in Superior Court 3. So our court does a lot of different types of cases. The ones relevant for today, though, are the cases uh, related to child abuse and neglect cases that get filed uh, for the entire county. Those, those come through Superior Court 3, uh, where I preside. And uh, you're going to meet here in just a minute then one of my best staff members, and that is Karen Bowen, who is the director of our CASA program, not only for Wayne County, but also for Union County. Yes, and we're going to get into that program a little bit more. But as you mentioned, let's meet Karen. Karen, welcome to the program. And tell thank us, you. Thank you. And tell us a little bit more about yourself and your connections in Wayne County. Sure. I have lived in Wayne County since I was about eight years old. I moved here from the Indianapolis area and moved away from Wayne County when I was 19, only to return. I'm very glad I did. This county, this area has been wonderful to me. I have been director at CASA since 2005, so two years after Judge took the bench. I've been with him almost the whole time. Uh, great job. I volunteered for this job many years in the 90s before I became a foster parent. And then I was a foster parent. And then I was blessed to come back as a director of the program for Wayne and Union Counties. All right. So some really deep roots, but also some experience away. And, and that always benefits. I love talking to people who have lived here, moved away and come back. And, and uh, they have the great stories of how the grass is not always greener on the other side. And so we do have great things going on here in Wayne County. And it's real easy when we're living here all the time to kind of see the things that aren't working so well. And uh, especially in, in your jobs, uh, you get to see that a little bit more firsthand than the rest of us. But it is always important to remember what makes Wayne County a great place to work, live, and play. Uh, as we talk about uh, the CASA program, I want to first give those of our viewers who don't know anything about it uh, an overview. So, uh, Judge, I'm going to post this one to you. If you could give us the, the big picture view of what the CASA program is. 
Sure, thank you. The, the CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. Uh, just by a quick way of background history, when I started in 2003, like I mentioned, our county was using, uh, appointing a, a person to represent the best interests of children uh, that were coming through court for abuse and neglect cases. But we, we had one person, it was what is referred to as a professional model because it was just one person with no volunteers that took care of all of the cases. Uh, keep in mind that the case number was significantly lower back then, so it was more manageable by just one person than it would be today. Uh, but upon, oh, probably three or four months after being on the bench, I was approached from people that run the state level CASA program mm -hmm. uh, saying, Judge Delaney, you know, Wayne County is one of the counties that is not part of the overall CASA program for the state. Would you consider, you know, moving over into that kind of a model? And I, hold on, I, I still feel like I'm <laughs> drinking from a from a fire hose just to to do the the day to day parts of the of the job. So you know, g give me give me like a year, and then please get back to me and let's talk about it further. So sure enough, a year passes, and it's knock knock knock. <laughs> Judge, we'd like to talk again, and I'm glad. Uh, n not that we had a bad program uh, before, uh, but there are many benefits to moving to a volunteer model. And so I was uh, quick to sign up, and they said, well, good. Now you've just made your life a little bit more difficult because now you have to figure out how you're going to go about implementing this, right? Uh, so, so step one is to uh, hire a director, get your director in place. We did interviews, and uh, Karen is somebody that I had known. Uh, she would not bring it up, but she used to be a step aerobics instructor at the Y, <laughs> and I would go there at lunchtime to work out or after work sometimes to work out as a young attorney and got to know Karen uh, from that originally, so it was nice to see a familiar face when she applied. Uh, we, we did decide to uh, move to that volunteer model in 2005, and I don't know that all the counties in the state are on the volunteer model now, but of the 92 counties, it's well into the upper 80s mm -hmm. that are members of the state CASA program. And then also, there is a national CASA uh, that, that helps control things more universally for, for uh, member states, of which Indiana is obviously one. So the, the, the idea behind the CASA is in the child abuse and neglect cases, we have a uh, parent, uh, another parent in a lot of cases, so a mother and a father, at least an alleged father. We have the state represented by the Department of Child Services. Mm -hmm. They all have their attorneys. Uh, the case is is uh, referred to as a CHINS case, Child in Need of Services, is the acronym explanation. And you can see then that the star of the show should be the child. The child, the child is the one person who really uh, in the absence of CASA, would not have a voice in the case, which I think anybody would tell you is a pretty absurd uh, result, right? For everyone else to have a voice and an attorney and, and uh, not the same rule for the child who's the star of the show or children. So because so the in, in, the, in a legal system, in a legal setting, uh, minors or people under the age of uh, adulthood or 18 in the state uh, don't have a voice in court unless they're represented by an attorney, and even then it gets a little a little confusing because an attorney is bound by certain rules that are different than just an, an advocate, as it were, um, for them. So talk a little bit, if you would, about what the CASA program adds to that environment in a legal setting for a child in need of services. Yeah, beautifully said, too. Summary there, Michael. So thank you. What the CASA then does is represents the best interest of the child. As you mentioned, an attorney is going to be directed by what the client says, this is what should happen. And, and if you think about it, a lot of our children that come through court are infants, uh, adolescents. We do get some older children as well, but in the abuse and neglect cases, very common for the child to be under the age of five. They're not going to be able to give good guidance to their attorney about, here's how I think we should approach. This should be our strategy <laughs> for the case, right? So it's going to be very difficult right. for an attorney to take on that role. Uh, best interest of the child. What is going to be the, what, what represents the best outcome or outcomes for the child? That is what the CASA is there to advocate for. 
Okay. And so they think about what is going to make for the best future of the child and keeping in mind that the best case scenario would be that um, whatever situation is negative will be resolved and it, you can go back to a healthy structured family uh, moving forward. That's not always the case. That, that can't always be the outcome. But in what you don't want to have happen is for that child to, as it is, fall through the cracks uh, and just be uh, lost in a system or in society. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need CASA at all, but we can recognize and accept we don't live in that perfect world. Uh, in a nearly perfect world, the role of the CASA would be very finite, right? There wouldn't be much need uh, for these volunteers to come in and, and represent the best interests of the children. We're not in a nearly perfect world either. And so we, we call on our CASA volunteers to really give their heart and soul to the cases. They, 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 they get greatly involved. They become the eyes and ears uh, for the court because they can come in and tell me, judge, this is what I observed. This is what I saw, what I heard, uh, what I smelled, sometimes what I tasted, uh, doing different uh, uh, site interviews or whatever site mm -hmm. visits. Uh, house visits, watching the children in public or watch how they interact with different people, including the parents. They relate all of that information on an unbiased uh, uh, platform uh, to the court for our, for our consideration. So the, the CASA volunteer, the advocate, doesn't have a vested interest in how things work out for them personally, their interest in what, works that, what will work out best for the child in the case. Exactly. Purely representing the best interest of the child or children. Now, one of the things that's striking me is we're, we're talking child in a, in a singular tense here, but in a family situation, there may be more than one child involved. Would that child then, uh, or those children, would they have the same CASA volunteer or would they maybe have more than one advocate? And maybe that's a question that's better suited for Karen. We'll bring her into the program now and uh, hit that one and then, and then get into the volunteers a little bit more. Um, and I'll answer that. Typically, it is the same volunteer for all the children in a family. I, at very one time only, have I ever divided children between volunteers, and that was only because there were eight of them. <laughs> and it felt like there was just a specific need for some of the older, some of the younger, than one person could handle. But yes, it is one volunteer. Okay. So we've talked a lot about in the program uh, court-appointed special advocates. There's a lot to break down in that. And the first thing is it's court appointed. So as you mentioned earlier, Judge, you were describing the program. Uh, it is it starts from the court and moves out. And it's kind of the court stepping up and saying, here's a population that needs some special attention. And so we're going to provide someone to provide that special attention for these children. Um, so it's court appointed and they're a special advocate. They, they have some special rules and they advocate. It's not really a legal position, although there is some law involved, but it's more of an advocate, a champion of youth, as it were. Plug for Wayne County Connection on the show there. Uh, and and uh, to champion them and to take up their case in this what could be a very intense situation for them, especially, as you mentioned, a lot of them are under five. So a lot to unpack with that, but let, let's focus right now on that, that advocate part, that, that, as you mentioned, a volunteer. So we've got someone in the community who is stepping up to take part in the best interests of a child that's not their own. And talk to us a little bit, Karen, if you will, describe that process that what that volunteer is, like in the big picture, what does that volunteer look like? In the big picture, and I think best said, is the person who knows that child the best and is able to put into words to the court what does suit best interest. Best interest is the key principle for everything. And you get, as a volunteer, you get to know all of the players. You get to know mom, you get to know dad, you get to know DCS, service providers, everybody that you're working with. But your key focus is the children, the baby, the teenager. And 
I feel like the most important and best part of this system whatsoever is to be able to get to know these kids. They are so wonderful. Our children in this county are wonderful. They go through some things when they're involved with the department, but they're just beautiful children. And it takes a lot of heart for our volunteers to get enmeshed in their lives. But they do. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that your background includes some time as a volunteer as a CASA before you became the director. Uh, do you just walk in off the street and say, hey, judge, uh, I'm here to represent so-and-so? Or, or it seems to me like it would be a little bit more involved than that. It is. Um, the volunteer actually goes through an application process. So we do the application. We do a background screening, um, criminal um sex abuse registries, all those registries there, they have to pass DCS background checks as well. The volunteers are then interviewed. They interview usually with me um, because I like to know who I'm getting ready to train and, they're, and who I'm getting ready to put in front of the court with these children and put with these children. I need to know them. Mm -hmm. So we do our interview. I'm very laid back with that. So I, I, I just like people to come in and talk to me and get to know more about the program, get to know each other. And then they all go through 30 hours of initial training. So they are taught best interest principles. They're taught DCS. They're taught the flow of the court, um, how to get information, where they need to get information. All of those training tools are given to them. And then they are sworn in by the judge. At, at the end of it all, and they are assigned a case. And throughout that case, then I actually supervise all the volunteers as well. Mm -hmm. So they have a method of like sending notes to me. They're able to call me. They're able to come in, sit down and talk. We talk through cases. We talk through questions. And so they're not left unsupported. They're not just kind of set out on their own, do your thing. They get, they have that support within this office and we, I have three staff members that are also able to sit down and talk with them, help them through anything that they need to do. So I'm, I'm going to interject here just a moment. We're coming down to the last third of our program and we haven't yet mentioned how people can get connected with you. So if you would give those quickly a uh, web address, uh, phone number, contacts that people can get in touch with you to learn more because there's a lot more that we're not going to be able to cover in this program. Absolutely. So our, our web address is wayneunioncasa.org. Uh, the phone number to the office is 765 nine seven three nine three one four and i just always tell people please leave a message there is no caller id in here and i am happy to return those those calls as soon as possible the email address for me directly is casa at co dot wayne dot i n dot us or now that we're back to face-to-face -face things, you can come straight in the courthouse. My office is to the left at the end of the hall on the first floor. It says CASA right above the door, and you are anyone, anyone that would care to volunteer or learn more about the program is more than welcome to come in and speak with us. Now, you mentioned training a minute ago and 30 hours of training, and I want to go back to the judge on this a little bit. Uh, there's a big difference between the advocate and a lawyer, and we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but why do you think it's important for CASA volunteers to not be lawyers, and why, why is that in the best interest of the child and, in fact, in the uh, best interest of our community? You know, I don't want to discount the idea of having an attorney as a CASA volunteer. We would encourage the members of our bar to, to consider that we have a, at least one person that comes to mind that is an attorney and CASA volunteer. Mm -hmm. And that can be very helpful then. You, you, you have to realize an attorney is going to have a, a, an edge when it comes to courtroom practices and policies. Uh, and that's why the training is so important. 30 hours is a lot of time to have to donate of your of your life for this training purpose right. and Karen said that at the end of it the judge swears them in uh, I think of that as the beginning uh, <laughs> for their for their venture as, as uh, CASA volunteers uh, attorneys would be very welcomed um, and and the training then doesn't 
equate anywhere near to a law degree or the experience of an attorney, but it does give the volunteer hopefully what they need to know nuts and bolts uh, to be able to successfully advocate for the child in court. I, again, they are the, the unique and only voice that comes at us from the child's perspective only without any baggage involved, without a, uh, mm -hmm. a goal or an end goal for, for what's going to happen. They're, they want what's best for the child. And so, you know, mother might have mother's own goals, father might have father's own goals, the state might have its own goals, but the one voice for the child is the CASA representative. I guess the question that I was kind of getting to or what I, what I was kind of looking for there was not that lawyers are bad, and, and lawyers definitely uh, do have a, a great deal of professional experience, um, but why, um, what, what barriers would there be? Why do we have a CASA instead of uh, like a public defender for the child? Oh, a lot of that is resource driven, Michael. Um, we, we struggle mightily here locally to get attorneys to represent the, the parents. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the parents that come through a, an abuse and neglect case aren't, aren't going to be able to afford to retain their own attorney. If they can, they certainly do. Uh, but for the most part, these are members of the local bar that are taking appointments from the court because that's part of their ethical obligation once they raise their hand and take their oath as attorneys is to accept these appointments. Uh, we, we use the same attorneys frequently because they become sort of specialists in this area and do a great job for us. But we're a smaller county, we have a smaller bar association and just finding attorneys for the parents has become very difficult to add on an, an attorney for each of the children in the cases uh, would be would be impossible from a research stand. Yeah, so the volunteer model to represent the children, uh, the children's best interest, the children's voice, the child's voice is just is crucial if we're going to have any representation or advocacy for the child at all. So what you're talking about is then without CASA and specifically the volunteers that make up CASA because really that's what makes up the whole office is all of the volunteers. And we can talk a little bit about how many are involved there in a minute. But um, without them, it, that would be a greater likelihood that a child might fall through the cracks or, or, or they might not get all of their best interests uh, presented to the court for the best outcome. Uh, and we know what not the best outcome can result in down the road. That would be a fair assessment. Oh, I, I think we can even be stronger than likelihood. I think it would be a probability, a strong probability that the child wouldn't have a voice. We're down to just a couple of minutes left in the program, and so I do want to talk specifically about the volunteers. And, and Karen, again, how many people, we've, we've mentioned it a couple of times, how many people are volunteering in your office right now? Sure. We have 16 volunteers right now, yeah, and I have four slated for training that will start in the beginning of May. And I, I was wanting to say that with that application process, if there is anyone interested in trying to meet that training in May, I have room, will make room, and would be happy to process those applications to get someone started as a volunteer in training um, in that May class. So there's still room. Please come see us. I I am really glad to see with the end and I, I'm going to say the end of COVID <laughs> with some of my folks are able to come back. Mm -hmm. So that's what's getting us, you know, it get, it's so valuable. And, and another thing I do want to say about the volunteer opportunity with CASA is aside from court hearings, aside from some of the meetings, which of course you have to schedule as a team, the, your actual interaction with the child is kind of in your own time which was wonderful for me when I volunteered. That was one of the reasons that I volunteered with this program, aside from my love for kids. Um, but I was able to, I had a family, young family at the time, and was able to go see these kids and spend time with them in my time. I had a full-time job mm -hmm. and a full-time family, but still was able to spend time with the children that I was volunteering for. Um, it's it's a unique opportunity to give to your community. It is a unique opportunity for the children of Wayne County, and the hearts of my volunteers are just precious. Would they're you, they're just magnificent people. I, I don't think we can ever say enough about volunteers and getting connected, and that's kind of what our program is all about: is making those connections. So we would encourage you if you're watching uh, and you 
yourself are interested or you think of someone that would be uh, a great person to be in this program, you know, mention it to them and, and make sure they get connected with Karen to do that. Uh, we're down to just the last couple of minutes. About how many children are serviced in Wayne County by the CASA program and families? It just did the numbers. We <laughs> are serving 76 children. Right now? At, right now. And, the and name, that is, that is does put some of my kids on a wait list. Um, we monitor some and don't like kids to be on a wait list. So we do still make sure they're okay. But to have an actual volunteer assigned to them, I have 75, 75 or 76. Yeah, so that was the next thing I was going to get to was, was is there a need? Uh, is, are your volunteers uh, stretched to the limit or, or, or do you have volunteers on the wait list waiting for children? And it sounds like that we need some volunteers. My volunteers are stretched to the limit and I'm uh, grateful that there are several of them that take more than one one case of or one family. I um, appreciate that. I also have to say I, I have a staff advocate too that is just magnificent asset to the program. She she serves probably about 25 children right now. Wow. Um, but she, she just does a really good job and she's valuable to the program, valuable to the children, valuable to our volunteers. Well, we might have to schedule another program to get that back on because we are now out of time. Judge Darren Dolahandy, Wayne Superior Court, uh, number three and the head of the Wayne Union CASA program here in Wayne and Union County and Karen Bowen, the director and uh, of CASA. We appreciate you being on the program. I, I've got a bunch of questions that I would love to ask you and, and for our viewers to see. So I'm going to encourage you, our viewers, to get connected with them. Uh, Follow up, rewind uh, if you're watching this online or streaming uh, to get that contact information again. And thank you both for being on the program again. Best wishes for future success. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And I'm your host again, Michael Swigert. Thanks for watching. Again, visit our website at waynenet.org slash cc for more information about the COS program or to get connected with them and uh, also with other agencies and opportunities in our community that are making Wayne County a great place to work, live, and play. Thanks, Wes, our director, and Jenny, our producer, and the staff here at Whitewater Community Television. Thanks for watching. See you next month.